All right, welcome back to the program, guys. Welcome back to the Fahim Anwar Dance Hour, the only podcast with zero regularity in posting schedule or format. The key to success is um, inconsistency and lack of format. That's what I've been told. So I think I just fire these up whenever I have enough stuff that I want to talk about. Or, And I, boy, do I have some stuff to talk about, guys. Where do I start? Okay. Uh, the big, this is the tent pole. The big soup de jour is Questlove's game night. So I got to go to Questlove of the Roots, you know, the drummer from the Roots and the Tonight Show and, you know, other projects and such. And yes, so I got to go to his game night. Um, where do I begin? I don't like, of course, I'm going to talk about game night, but maybe I should talk about the genesis of how this came to be. Life is funny that way, these worlds colliding and such. All right, how do I start? Uh, I guess, okay, let me give you the whole, I should do like a, the last dance timeline. We'll just go back in years and this will turn into an eight-part miniseries for Netflix. Is that cool? This is, a, this is a tangent here, but like when I was watching the Epstein doc on Netflix, it was so good that part of you is like, oh man, I kind of wish he got away with a few more crimes to get some like more episodes. Obviously, I'm joking, but... Uh, that's a comedic slant on, you know, atrocities that get put into a miniseries because you enjoy watching it and you're like, oh man, I wish this person would have killed for longer. Why'd they have to catch him so soon? I could have enjoyed a second season. Joking, of course. Joking. That's not how I really feel. Sometimes people think jokes is, is like that it's not a joke and that I would say these things at a bus stop. And you go, no, I'm on a stage and I'm holding a microphone. That's how you know I don't mean these things. You know how my voice is amplified? And there are a bunch of people with two drink minimums like staring at me on an elevated stage. If I was at Ralph's saying these things, sure, I'm a monster. But like dim lighting, it's like Ideas Fight Club. You paid to like laugh like a slumber party. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting off track here. So I guess it started with... Uh, a long time ago, a few years ago, I did Black Thoughts show in Brooklyn, also of the roots. So we should do like a, a tree, sort of like a, you know, like how it started. So I did Black Thought, uh, Tariq, Tariq is his name. And then uh, I did show in, in um, Brooklyn. So I did that. It was like in this warehouse. It was like a... It was like, like a scene from Step Up. That was kind of the performance space, you know, where they have like a final battle in a warehouse. It's always in a warehouse. That's where the real dancing goes down. Not in a studio, in a fucking aluminum warehouse. So it was outfitted to do a stand-up show. It was very cool. There was a lot of cool Brooklyn hipster people. I did my set. I guess it was good. He, he liked me. So I met Black Thought there. We became friends. He stayed in touch. So we would text um, you know, throughout the year a little bit. And then I guess maybe, maybe through him, maybe that's how Questlove found out about my comedy. And, and then like one, one day Questlove reposted, uh, my nineties hip hop bit from my CISO special that nobody watched. More people watched that clip from him reposting it than like the entire special when it came out on CISO. So I'm like, oh, cool. He he knows my stuff. That's awesome. And then I, when I did the Tonight Show and I brought my parents, he came through to the green room, said hello to my parents. Very gracious. He was super nice, too. And so I think that's when we got to, like, formally meet face-to-face. -face. Uh, oh, no, actually, before oh, – fuck, what was it before? Maybe it was before then. I was doing Denver. I know you want to get to the meat of this fucking Questlove game, but I, I got to do the genesis. I got to do the backstory, Okay. This is like Lord... You can't watch Lord of the Rings 3 without 1. Is that a good analogy? You can't watch Harry Potter 6 without 1. You need to know Robert Pattinson died. Did I spoil it for you? Fuck. Uh, I was doing some show... I was doing comedy works in Denver. And then Tariq hits me up and he goes, Yo, The Roots, we're playing a show in Denver too. We want to come through. We want to see your show before we have to do our show. Which is wild to me. They are just so much more... Just better... They're a, they're a bigger thing and more important thing than me, and they're gonna take time out to like they gotta they're playing this huge venue too, but they want to come see me do this comedy club, which is great. I love comedy works, but 
it's like apples and oranges. That's like rock star shit. And they're like, they want to see me do some, some ha ha's in a basement. So then I work it out with their tour manager. And then so Tariq and Questlove show up to, to watch, to watch me do my headlining set in Denver, Denver comedy works. And then they have to like bounce immediately. So they say, what's up before in the green room, I'm going to say hello. And then they have to go do their show. And I wish I could have gone, gone see their show, but I had to do a second show. And then, okay, so then flash forward to tonight's show. Uh, say what's up to Amir. Uh, that's Questlove. So it says hi to my parents and all that. Very gracious, super nice. He was like, oh, your son's great. And that was kind of, you know, I don't know, because I think when your parents, they don't want you to do comedy and all that stuff. It's n Things are good now, but it's nice for them to get these other data points of people uh, like respecting your son, like, oh, you should be very proud. And they're like, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should be proud of my son. So that was cool. Did tonight show. And then, uh, we text a little bit and I would see on, you know, we follow each other on IG. I would see, he, he hosts these game nights and they look insane. I saw one of his, cause he does a photo dump of the game night. And I think the last one I saw on his IG was from New York. And in the picture, it's just insane. It's a slew of insane celebrities like Taylor Swift was at the game night. And I don't think I'm, you know, going to be part of this or anything. I'm like, Oh cool. He does these insane game nights. And then, then I get a text that he's doing one in LA and I'm invited. I'm invited. I'm invited to game night. And so, I mean, amazing. I mean, a small part of me was like, what if me and Taylor Swift become an item? Look, I saw a picture of her in the New York game night, game nights coming to LA Maybe T, T Swift is there. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm her vibe. But then this Travis Kelsey fucking thing, this guy cock blocks me just because he can catch a football and rough some boys up. He thinks he's better than me. So, I mean, guys, we could have been a power couple, but, uh, you know, this Travis Kelsey guy is, you know, stepping in between me and her. I also don't think I'm famous enough to to date Taylor Swift. Not yet. That's my goal, just to get famous enough to where I can be like track three on an album. Oh yeah, I had this thought. Like Taylor Swift doesn't she doesn't really date regular guys. She kind of has like a celebrity fetish. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, you know. I think part of the appeal of that is because it makes her songs more interesting when she writes about her exes. Like when she writes about her ex, it's it just fuels the fandom. We're like, oh, I think it's about Jake Gyllenhaal. Did you know track five is actually about Leonardo DiCaprio? I don't know. She wasn't really linked to Leonardo DiCaprio. But no one gives a shit if she writes like a song about her ex and it's a branch manager from Chase Bank. Like no 13-year-old girl is like, you fucking wronged our queen, Brad, who works at Chase Bank. And he's like, yeah, I wanted it to work. It didn't. I have to work with this client right now. Can you please stop yelling at me? So, yeah, okay, so it's not going to happen, me and Taylor Swift. That's, I, I had to get over that. She wasn't at the party. But uh, I get invited to this game night, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I Uber there, and it's it's up in the hills. It's like one of these, like, giant houses that they have for, like, parties and stuff. It's sponsored by Cheetos, of course. That's how high level these parties are now, where they're, like, sponsored by a corporation. I kind of want to do that even though I'm not there yet. Just like pretend that I'm sponsored by Dr. Scholl's or something. And I'll get a neon Dr. Scholl sign and get inserts for everybody. Like like they're paying me to throw on this this party. I'm not there yet. So no one is sponsoring my parties. Fahim is sponsoring his parties. So Cheetos is sponsoring it, I believe. There was like a Cheeto sign. There was a giant spread of Cheetos. There was Cheeto-inspired culinary or culinary whatever the word i don't know how the if you're a chef right into the pod tell me how to say it he man or dance hour at gmail.com so tons of cheetos there was tables with different board games but like uno everyone wanted to play uno that's like the game of the moment it's, it's having a, it's having a moment because even when i saw the pictures of the new york game night everyone was playing uno and i'm like that looks like fun never played uno in my life i was kind of nervous i was like fuck I should bone up. I should know how to play Uno. Like I thought it was like blackjack or or poker or something. There was like crazy skill involved. And my buddy was like, it's a child's game. Because I was like, yo, we should have a practice round. I didn't want to embarrass myself 
if it was complicated, he's like, you'll be fine. It's You could pick it up. He kind of made fun of me for like wanting to practice Uno. But I did download the Uno app, and I got I got a few hands in digitally. Uh, yeah, Uno. Okay, so oh, I was thinking it'd be funny if I like went about this totally wrong. Like my idea was like I'm gonna go to this this like celebrity game night and crush everyone at Uno. Like I'm gonna get a hoodie, I'm gonna wear sunglasses, I'm not gonna talk to anybody, and I'm just gonna like try to win Uno. Just try to demoralize and humiliate all these people. And they're like, that's kind of a fucking asshole. I'm like, yeah, but he won, didn't he? Like, zero networking whatsoever. I just go to, like, kill at Uno and then leave. I go, who was that asshole? I think his name is Fahim Anwar. He's a huge asshole, but he's he's an assassin on the Uno table. So I get there. You know, it's kind of nice because I don't know anybody. I know, I know Questlove. But then I didn't think I would know anybody at this party. So as soon as I get out of the Uber, Jade, who's in, Jade Ketapreta, another stand-up comedian, she goes, Fahim? I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? So her and her girlfriend were going into this party as well. So it was nice to have somebody that I knew. Uh, I sat at a table. There was, like, different tables going on. And then we're playing. I've never played Uno before, but uh, we played one game. And then I, I won. I killed it, guys. I, with No prep. Your boy, your boy killed it. Your boy won. And then between game one and two, M- Megan the Stallion. Is that, am I saying it right? <laughs> I'm saying it like it's a court deposition. Like Megan the Stallion. I'm like, I'm hitting it really hard. She shows up and then she's at our table. And she's all about Uno. And she she's like, this is this is her jam. I also know the thing about Uno, I've realized everyone has their own house rules, the way they grew up. Like no one has the same two Uno rules. Like they kind of make shit up on the fly. She was taking liberties is all I'm saying. Okay. So like she was, I don't know if you're allowed to do this or not. Maybe write in the comments what the rules are or so she was chaining. So if you got a plus four, you can like drop another plus four on top of that. Is that allowed? I don't know. Maybe it is. But but then you weren't allowed to chain plus twos. Just chain f- plus fours for some reason. I don't know you can do that, though, because I thought that when you when you drop a plus four, you have to say what the color is. So you say, oh, wait, can you, though? Fuck. Is she in the right? Because I was going to say, if you drop a plus four and you go red plus four, then if you have a plus four, you can choose whatever that color is then, too, right? So then you could say red plus four. I don't know. So that that was her house rules. But there was a moment where I'm kind of winning, you know, and then she pointed out to everybody that like to gang up on me and not let me win. So she was like, he, he probably doesn't have a red. That's probably his last red, but she didn't know I had like three reds. So there was a moment where like, she thought I was out of reds and then I, you know, I bust the red out and then, you know, I talked a little trash. I, kind of, I stood up and I, I made a meal out of it because she was coming at me. So I had to come at her and she understood. I think she appreciated the back and forth. And there was a moment when she was like getting the whole table to like gang up on me. I was like, don't listen to her, guys. She's she's self-interested here. Like she's talking crazy. Who are you going to believe? Meg or Fahim? <laughs> I, I've been at this table longer. She just comes in here. She's trying to she's saying kooky stuff, guys. Anyways, who, who's next? But there was a moment where I'm almost out of cards. And then there was a skip. And then it was somebody's turn, but then she was like, no, no, they're taking too long. They're not all that. She like made up this rule. She was like, nah, they forgot about their thing. It moves on. But like, it should it should have been my turn to like unload my cards. So even with that, eventually it goes back around and I, I had a W, which was a wild card. So whatever the fuck is on that pile, Daddy's winning. Throw it down. Daddy wins. Two games of Uno. I didn't win the last one. Meg's friend won that one. But that's not bad. That was that was that was a W. I won. So many people just think, oh, okay. So uh, so when like kind of the first game, I see weird out. <laughs> I'll give you a list of who was there. All right. This is just. It's interesting. It's mind boggling. It's it's novel. I'm at a point in my life where it's novel. 
if I was in my 20s, I'd be geeking out so much. This would be like, I'd be riding high. I would think this is like such an indicator of things. And like, I think when you're younger, you get wrapped up in all the shit that doesn't matter. And I'm just so far along in my career now where it's just, it's neat. It's a byproduct. You want this shit to be the byproduct, not the engine of your art or business. Like, I wouldn't want to do this all the time. It was fun to do for this, but like that doesn't fuel me. But it is neat. I will, this is why I wanted to talk to you guys about it because there's novelty in it and it is neat and it is absurd. So, who's at this party? Okay, Tyler the Creator is at this party. He showed up later. Um, Quest Love was there, obviously. Uh, Babyface, R&B legend Babyface was there. Chrissy Teigen was there. Um, Joy, Joy Taylor, I believe that's her last name. Um, maybe that's not her last name. I don't know. Jo- the sports, sports analyst. Um, she was there. Uh, Megan the Stallion was there. Uh, Weird Al was there. So, so, oh, Jason Sudeikis showed up as well. Jason was there. So at the beginning of the party, you know, I see Weird Al kind of just milling about by himself just for a moment. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I rec- I've been that per. I don't know anybody at this party, really. And I'm like, uh, this is like a cool, I go, I'm going to talk to Weird Al. A few years ago, I would never do that. I would just be too shy and, I don't know. I've made conscious decisions to just kind of like, you, you don't have to be that way. If you want to like live a different way or just step outside yourself a little bit. So I'm more evolved and I'm allowed, like, I can do this now. I see Weird Al and I'm like, I want to, when else am I going to talk to Weird Al? So I, I grab a bag of Cheetos because I'm hungry. <laughs> and then I walk up to Weird Al. I'm like, hey, man, like, uh, you know, big fan. And have you been to one of these games? So I just start chatting up Weird Al and it was pleasant. It was awesome. Um, and we just talk about comedy and then these game nights. And he was like, yeah, my wife didn't want to come to this one. Like, um just talking about, I'm like, yeah, I grew up with your stuff. And like, obviously I'm a big fan. And I'm like, who's like the biggest, I go, this life is so, he goes, how do you know Amir, you know, Questlove? And I told him the whole story that I told you guys. I'm like, life is funny that way. Just paths crossing and such. And and I'm like, also, I think we have a mutual friend, Neil Brennan. He's like, oh, I just did his podcast. So watch out for that. Weird Al on Neil Brennan's great podcast called Blocks. And we were just chatting and it was fantastic. And then someone snapped a photo of, of um, Weird Al and myself. It's like such a good photo of me. I don't Well, maybe we'll throw it up. It's just funny. Like the best photo of me ever, ever taken is me eating Cheetos next to Weird Al. I should just like call him up whenever I need to look good. Just be like, can you just stand next to me and crop out the Cheetos? It's a good look for Cheetos though. Um, they sponsored, they sponsored the event and they get a, a like a hot pick. He man or Weird Al eat Cheetos. It's on Sun Magazine. So it was great. Then he had to go back to his table, play another game of Uno. But, I mean, that was awesome. Um, chatting to Weird Al. And then, uh, yeah. It was, then I talked to, uh, I, you know, you get to meet people and stuff. There's another guy, Sean. We were talking about, he's like, he, he just came out with this board game. Interesting to talk to people from who were, like, really successful in their own right from just other fields. There was this classically trained pianist who, who was there, too. Yeah, you just kind of forget people are people. Um and then you get to be, it's probably fun for all those people there too, where you can just play games and you're not kind of like whatever your identity is. It doesn't really matter at that moment. You're just like a child playing board games and it, it was fun. So that was that, man. That was the scoop. Is there any, any more, uh, I'm trying to think cool shit. Oh, I took a shot with Megan the Stallion. That was neat. It was like a tequila shot, I believe. She took it with some tahine. I'll throw that out there. Yeah, I guess that's about it. That's pretty good, right? If I think of anything else, I'll let you guys know, but that's pretty much, that's like the most name droppy of name droppy, but it was just such a, it was like a dream. It was like a bizarre dream. It was awesome. So Questlove, thank you for the invite. Thank you for letting me be a part of game night. Uh, My mom is funny. She's like, why is he called baby face? Why? And I'm like, I don't know, mom. I think because he has a baby face. No, then I go, I, I go, he, he's actually a baby. <laughs> I told my mom. I go, he's actually a baby, mom. 
they just he he has a disease but he's actually a baby and they put sunglasses on him and they put adult clothes on him but he was just saying goo goo gaga during all the the games so yeah there you go i guess the week before the game night i i opened for whitney she shot her special at the comedy store in the main room she's pregnant she's prego she's prego in the special guys i wish there was an equivalent for guys for male comedians because that's like a cool look like that's kind of a new thing you get to be prego while on stage what what will be my thing maybe i just want to get really fat for a special like christian bale it i'm just going to put on 200 pounds (laughs) because most people when they when they like do body transformations it's for a movie but i want to do it for a comedy special where there was no reason for me to put on that much weight like it's self-imposed like this this next guy, he put on 200 pounds of fat for his special. He wanted to be really funny up there for you guys. He just looks funnier at this weight. It's like UFC. Certain fighters are are the best at a certain weight. Certain comedians are funniest at a certain weight. That'd be great. Maybe just do a focus group where they kind of like use AI to put to have you at different amounts of weight and then do a focus group. They go, I like him at 375. <laughs> I think he's really funny at 375. I feel like everyone would just, the focus group is the fattest. Now, there's kind of a sweet spot. You can't be like my 600-pound life where people are concerned for you. You have to at least be mobile. You you can't, people can't be concerned for your joints when you're walking around. So as long as y- your skeleton can move around a little a little fluidly, that's just funny. That's, you know... Like maybe Mike and Molly, kind of, that's the sweet spot. You don't want to get above that. Like you don't want scooters involved. You don't want oxygen tubes involved because then it's, you can't laugh as much. It's like when you see people slipping on ice, it's very funny. Anyone falling down who's young, laugh hysterically. An older person, you you have to find out they're okay before you start laughing. You see them slip on the ice and and they go, "Are, are they okay? But if, if they're like 21 and they fall, please break every bone in your body. That's how you know you're, I'm afraid for that moment. Like, like if you fall and then people are concerned for you, you're like, fuck, I'm old. Like that, that's, that's the next tier of like being asked for your ID or not being asked for your ID when you buy alcohol. So that's the first I'm getting old. And the next one is when you fall, people go, oh, <gasps> instead of <laughs> you fall and they go, oh, dear God, check his vitals. If you fall and people go check his vitals, and you go, I'm not that old. You can laugh. And they go, Gramps, are you Gramps? <laughs> I used to get mad when you called me, sir. You're fucking calling me Gramps now. Gramps, are you okay? Like he's not even your grandson. Gramps. Man, call call me bro. I'm still a bro. All right. I guess we'll answer some emails. Is there anything else about that uh, party that I should discuss? Eh, I'll, I'll give you some texture. So there's a bathroom. You go into the bathroom. I've never seen this at a party. The bathtub was filled with ice. And there was beverages in the bathtub. That's a move I've never seen. The bathtub can become a cooler? So that's like a HGTV, uh, you know, whatever. That's a trick for if you're like hosting or something. That's a, just fill the bathtub with ice. There you go. So put it with little knickknacks and stuff in there. That was pretty cool. The Cheeto spread was great. I did think that was a bold move, though, just to have Cheetos sponsor the event where you have to use your hands on this. Everyone has fucking Cheeto fingers. That That's uh, I mean, look, I'm no shade to Cheetos. They're a delicious snack and chip. They're not sponsoring me. You, you know, I, I would say even more great glowing things if you did sponsor me. But if you have Cheeto dusted, it's not the cleanest snack is all I'm saying. And Ch- Cheetos knows this about itself. It should come with latex gloves. Doritos, also not not the cleanest. 
Not the cleanest chip. Uh, a Pringle, pretty clean. I'm trying to think. A kettle chip, pretty clean. But Cheetos, you're going to get your hands dirty. you got to roll up your sleeves. So they sponsored the thing. They had a whole spread, different types of Cheetos offerings. I had a Cheeto slider. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, okay. I think I nailed it. And then I took an Uber home. What a night, guys. What a night. And then I didn't even know that I would have access to the photos. Then they sent me the, like, you know, the Dropbox with all the photos. And I'm like, these are fantastic. Uh, although I wish there was a photo of me destroying Meg the Stallion. That would have been great. But the lore is better than the photo. All right, there you have it. I guess, okay, I'll answer some emails. A few trickled in between last time and now. Let me get off airplane mode because I give you my undivided attention, folks. I can't have any buzzing when I'm talking to the peeps. Okay, okay, what do we got? All right, this is from Merle Alexander. Welcome back-ish, in parentheses. You, yeah, welcome back-ish is right. We don't know. Is this consistent or this is the last time I talked to you for three months? I'm, I'm like a dad who, who may walk out on you guys. I'm going to go get some smokes. That's what I say at the end of every podcast. And that's how you know I'm not coming back. I'm going to go get some smokes. Gentlemen. I guess I'm gentlemen. Two weeks ago, I realized that you guys were back from your hiatus. Parentheses. Not referring not referring any updates or notification from po Apple Podcasts. And listen to every episode, 96 until the very latest. And I'm really glad that the boys are back. My question for you all, Fahim, Ali, and Aristotle. They're not here, so I'll field this one. Is regarding video editing slash production. Video editing has always been a passion of mine, and I was wondering if you knew of a good starting point to make a career out of it. I want to do something that I love for a living. Thanks in advance, and even if you don't, I appreciate you reading this email. Take care. Merle from Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> well, careful about those aliens out there. Is that you get that a lot? Probably every time. <laughs> oh, Roswell. You see any aliens when you're out there? Oh. It's sort of like when people find out I'm a comedian, I go, they go, oh, you're a comedian. Well, tell me a joke. Oh, you're a comedian, huh? Tell me a joke. And I'm like, eh, it doesn't really work that way. The vibe isn't right. Nah, come on. Like they think that being at a Whole Foods with this lighting is going to, there's certain circumstances, okay? It's just, it's not the time or place. You're a comedian. So sorry about the alien thing, dude, but, you know, I had to do it to you. Okay, you want to make video editing a job or profession? I don't know. Do it as a hobby for at first. Maybe hop on Fiverr, get really good at it. Get good at, at Adobe Premiere. I would say that's kind of industry standard. Adobe Premiere or Final Cut. Probably Adobe Premiere. And then uh, once you're adept at it, uh, maybe also take a class if you want. Go to a community college. Just like really learn it's one of those things, though, where you don't need crazy certification or something. You just need to be really good at it. So just get re really good at it and get hired to do it. And then maybe start small and then your name gets passed around and you kind of work begets work. So just immerse yourself in it. Really learn the program inside and out and get good at it. And then get gigs, get jobs, start small and then snowball it. Boom. Nailed it. There you go, Merle. Merle. Okay, let's do another one, guys. I'm 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 nailing these. Okay, I have a folder. It's called mailbag. Let me let me okay, okay. This is from Roshan Hedge. That's that that could be a great wrestling name. I don't know if you wrestle for a living or not, but if you ever want to pivot, it's a waste of a name if you don't. Roshan Hedge. And then he trims you. Question for the pod. Dear Fahim, my name is Roshan, and here is my question. Thank you for uh, bracing me for the question. Because some people go straight into the question, and my knees buckle. And sometimes there's a glass table nearby, and I break the glass table, and I have to remove shards of glass from my face and other exposed areas. Like sometimes I'm wearing a tank top, so the glass even gets into my shoulders and armpits. 
And I just have to pray it doesn't hit a major artery. So thank you for, you know, loading me up with the question. On your most recent pod, you made a point about a comedian becoming a phenomenal motivational speaker because of better jokes. That is actually really profound. Uh, okay, I don't know about that, but I'll take I'll take the compliment. If you think of it as dials on a guitar amplifier, where one knob is jokes and the other is motivational speak, there is probably a setting which could produce an amazing and unique comedy special. Enough jokes to be comedy, but a motivational theme woven in. My question is, if you were to weave a motivational theme into one of your specials, can you think of what that theme might be? If you don't have an answer, it's okay. But I just wanted you to think about the question. I work in the mental health field. Oh, so not wrestling. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I guess it's like wrestling of the mind. And I have shown some clients excerpts of your Joe Rogan interview where you talked about rushing while putting creamer in your coffee at Starbucks because you didn't want to inconvenience others. Then realizing that you are allowed to take the time that it takes. Uh, that is a quote. I did say that. Um, that you were born, you are alive, and you can take your time. It has really helped some of my clients. Cheers, Roshan. Well, that's super sweet and nice. Um, I have gotten DMs about that part of the interview from Rogan. That's what's interesting about that podcast is that it is so far-reaching and wide-reaching. You think you're just talking to your friend, and you think that you may be having these singular experiences, and you find out after the fact that maybe that did strike a chord with some faction of the population who... I didn't know that that was like a universal, I mean, not everyone has this because even Joe, it was kind of foreign to Joe when, when I was talking about it with him, but I got DMs from some people who are like, I feel exactly that way too, or I know what you're talking about. And, you know, getting this email telling me that you, that excerpt has helped people. That's neat. That wasn't my intent, but that's, it's cool. I mean, the cliff notes version of it, I guess, for if you're not familiar was there was a time in my life where, I don't know, I would have this anxiety or I just always felt like I I was in people's way or I, or I wasn't comfortable being observed. That was like the first part of it is just like just living through life. You just feel like eyes are on you or people are <clears throat> just constantly looking at you and or judging. Uh, but like, honestly, nobody gives a shit. Everyone's so busy with themselves. And if they are, Go ahead and look. There's really being comfortable being observed is very powerful. That was like a powerful transition for me. It's just like no one's looking at you. And if they are, who cares? I'm just getting coffee creamer. It's not a big deal. And then I'm not in anyone's way. I'm, I'm taking like a human amount of time to do this task. Um, and I'm allowed to do that because I bought. So that was like a big revelation, I guess. And then I guess it's resonated with other people and I guess it's helping, you know, some of this guy's clients. So that's cool. So what would my, if I did pivot into motivational speaking, what would my through line be? <sighs> Man, you know, I should probably, I'm, you probably, I should probably marinate on it for like a week or two if I really want to Tony Robbins it. You don't, you don't find an angle on a whim after reading an email, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head right now. Maybe I would think there's a lot of noise in life, not literal noise, but just sort of like mixed signals. And there's a lot of uh, things to get you off track and your brain could go on tangents and stuff. I would think it, it would be listening to you or being able to tune in to like, you and not being distracted by the noise like yeah even on a microcosm level like me pursuing comedy and doing comedy there were a lot of obstacles like I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing I think my upbringing and such and I should just be an engineer I should be a doctor I should have done there was like so much gravitational force pulling me to do that it took a lot to jump outside of that also, I mean, this sounds bougie or whatever, but like my financial circumstances, I, I come from an immigrant middle class 
middle upper class family doing comedy is like slumming it. Uh, it's almost like throwing away all that they've done. And um, I was smart enough to to like be a doctor or I could have done that if I wanted to. And that's like the blueprint. That's the path I should be doing. But I, my signal or my tuning fork for what I like to do. And I don't know, I'm really good at listening to myself or knowing what, what I like, what brings me joy. I'm very, like, I'm very attuned to what brings me joy and what, what is my purpose um, I don't get, I don't do things for other people. I don't get caught up in that. And it, it is easy to, in life, just to get swayed, just doing things because somebody, ha for other people have expectations of you doing it for you versus doing it for your parents or doing it for a spouse or doing so being able to cut all that noise out and listen to you and do what brings you happiness. But the thing is when you do that, you, you have to take ownership of it. You have to, there's no boss. You're the boss. So you have to, like when I wanted to do comedy and all that, I had to be methodical. I had to be clinical. I had to set up a plan. I had to do a lot of comedy. I had to do shitty open mics and you have to be that taskmaster because nobody's going to do it for you. And it's easier to say you want to do the thing than to do the thing. So I don't know. I'm trying to find out an answer. I'm trying to talk talk out an answer, I'm trying to figure it out while talking. I would say knowing what you want to do, listening to yourself, being true to it, and then honoring that truth and not going to parties all the time and actually doing the thing, figuring out what the thing you want to do and actually doing the thing and taking steps towards it. Maybe that's too nebulous to be a Tony Robbins North Star kind of that was my stab at it, okay? Give me a few weeks, and then I'll have packets, and then I'll have different levels for you to buy into, and then I'll have a weekend seminar where it's like half yoga, and then I come out, and everyone cheers, and I'm wearing white linen and no shoes. Yeah, you can't wear shoes if you're tapped into, like, the spiritual world. You can't be wearing Air Jordans, and you're like, I figured it out, guys. I talked to God, and he wanted me to look fresh. Check out my drip. No, you have to have nondescript. You have to wear like a coffee bean bag, just like a burlap sack, and uh, it's like a beard. It's the way to do it, man. You can't you can't be in Gucci and have like one of those fucking Chewbacca satchels. Who knew Chewbacca was hype beasting before everybody else? Man, I wish I could do a Chewbacca. I would have done the. <laughs> 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 That'd be funny to be like, I do a mean Chewbacca impression. Check this out. And you go, ah, oh, fuck. Normally I can do it. Hold on. It's on a date. And then I barf. And I go, you'll, you'll get half of this, right? I like to go on dates and I pay for the whole thing. And then I send a Venmo request when I get home for the entire amount. Not even half. And, I, and then I just write, it's 2023. I'm a feminist. And it says Fahim requests three hundred dollars and then i write sorry i drank so much <laughs> like 60 percent of the bill was just booze and it was just shit face and i'm like it's been great i'm doing it again sometime oh my my lift is here bye and then i get into an, a pool it's a lift pool <laughs> that'd be funny to orchestrate the worst date in the world just run up a 300 hundred dollar bar tab and then leave in a lift pool and then, yeah, send her a Venmo request. All right, another email. This is from Sohail Khan. Subject heading, I am part of your demo. Parentheses, age 37, brown dude, married with a kid, likes funny people. Fuck yeah, dude. Thank you. We need more of you. Um, I have followed you since Chuck. You are the funniest. Sent from my iPhone. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks, dude. All the way from Chuck days. My brother always jokes, he, like whenever I buy something, he's like, you got all that Chuck money. He thinks that I'm, that I just made so much money from one guest star of Chuck. So like anytime I pay for something, he's like, oh, all that Chuck money, huh? All that Manoush Deepak money. Okay, this is from Sir Kozo. 
Interesting name. You should get into wrestling too. I'm just learning a lot of my fans have great wrestling names. So if they want to pivot. Subject heading, worst moments to do bits. Hi, Fahim. My name is Sergio. All right. Why is your, why is your email say sir? Sir Cozo. My name is Sergio. I'm from Colombia. I discovered you last year by watching Hat Trick. And now I get excited every time you drop your works on Stuff Series. I wanted to know if you have had awkward moments where you have pushed bits or jokes a little too much in a social setting. I always see comedians talking about uh, how they only feel their true selves when being with other comedians. Do you think this is true? I'm curious about your general experience in navigating bits slash jokes during non-comedy settings. Looking forward to your next special. Hey, thanks, Sergio. Mm, trying to think. You know... I'm not a very bit or gaggy guy with people I don't know. It's interesting. Um, like at this ge game night, Quest Loves Game Night, I didn't know a ton of people. I'm sitting at a table, and I kind of lay in the cut. That's that's my MO. I don't bounce off the walls. I'm funnier when I'm comfortable with people. Like you're in my close circle, and I know you. Then I can be me. Or if I'm on stage, if I'm doing a performance thing, I could turn it on. Or there's a time and place I feel comfortable to do it. With people I don't really know, I'm not I'm not that guy. It's not my default setting. So I'm not like you would have no idea that I even do stand up. It's funny, there's a at the party, there was a cool guy there. He was taking photos. He actually took because I posted on my Instagram some of these photos. Christian, his name's Christian. So he was also saying some of the Uno rules. And like I was winning, and they were like, ah, oh, the, quiet, the quiet ones always win, or the quiet, so I was kind of like the quiet guy. But I was just being normal. I think it'd be weird for me to be there, be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you got the reds, blah, 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 blah. Oh, you, you, like, that feels weird to me. Um, that's, not, that's not my baseline. So, yeah, my MO is kind of, like, quiet, I guess. Um, what, why am I talking about this? I, oh, yeah, so I'm not really, like, pushing boundaries in a joking setting that way. Uh, also, I know certain things, like, I'll have a joke that's, like, maybe pretty dark, and if I don't know the person well enough, I will re refrain from doing from doing it, because I don't think they can handle it. Although, sometimes it's fun to do as a test, just like, all right, I'm going to throw this out there. Let's see what type of person you are, because if they laugh really hard, then we, we've just become friends. Like, if you, if you can laugh at that darkness this early, it's a match made in heaven. Uh, yeah, it's easier to talk to comedians because there's a shorthand. It's almost like two military people talking to each other. We have the same language. That's why I always love the comedy store is my place of work. It's also my social settings. I do my set and I hang around and I get to talk to my other comedian friends. Uh, we're just experiencing a lot of the same things. We, everyone's coming back from a comedy club on the road or touring. You could trade notes like, how is this club? Um, what are you doing? Uh, how was the Laugh Factory? How was... There's just the shorthand. You don't have to educate people to the lifestyle like you do, I don't know, someone who's not in comedy. Yeah, it just feels like... Uh, you're just talking to a friend, and it's less TED talky, and you're just talking about life, what you've been up to. You don't have to educate them on terms, and they get it, dude. But I like talking to non comics too. It's sometimes it's nice. It's a little insular sometimes when you're just dealing with comedians the whole time. So even doing that, like game night, was fun. Fun to do something outside of people in your own field, because there's people doing so many exciting, great things in different fields too. And you get a new perspective. There's, a, you know, my buddy Eric. I think I talked about him on the pod. He's he's in tech. He's a tech guy. Went to Harvard Business School. He loves stand-up. And then his world is so fascinating. And there's a lot of crossover. Like, I will learn things through things that he knows about business. And then he will learn things just from, like, stand-up. Or maybe the way I craft a joke. Or why I did this joke instead of that. Or So it's a symbiotic relationship. You can learn from different disciplines. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, yeah, check out my next special, baby, when it comes out. It'll be, you know, I'm taping it in Nashville. So if you're in Zanies uh, or Nashville, I'll be taping it at Zanies, October 25th, two shows, early show and late show. Come to one of them. All right. Fucking we did it, man. We, we nailed the mailbag. 
there you have it. Quite, quite the adventure. Game night was amazing. I have to wait for Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift to wait for that to fizzle out. And then that's when your boy slides in. Do I get to choose my track? Like on my first date with her, I'm like, can I be track 12? It's my lucky number. And just look, we'll have some good times, but promise me I'll be track 12. And I don't want to be part of a double disc. Single CD. Okay. All right. Maybe I write a joke about Taylor and then she writes a song about me. And then we can do like love box and speaker below like a big boy, Andre 3000. So it's just two CDs and it's one song with hers. And then, and then my joke is on the other disc. And then obviously nobody listens to my CD. And then she wins several Grammys for her song. And everyone thinks I'm a piece of shit. But I'm like, yeah. Then I write a song about my side, but nobody, it has like, it has 20 streams. 10 are from me and 10 are from my mom. And Taylor Swift has 500 billion streams. All right, guys, that's the pod. I should, uh... oh yeah, I'm doing Houston Improv. Come to that. So October 20th and 21st, I'll be I'll be at the Houston Improv. There's some dogs barking outside. They're big fans. They'll be there too. All right, I got to pick a song. You know, I'm pretty bad at, um... oh, okay. Oh, all right, man, okay. This song, this reminds me, this is something that happened. So I'm a big fan of Frank Moody. They're a great band. Do a deep dive. So many great tracks. And then I saw the other day Frank Moody reposted. I used, During quarantine, I had this series called 15 Second Dance Tutorials where I, I would wear a headset that was really blowing out audio. And I'd be like, welcome to the Man where or 15 second dance tutorial the only dance tutorial where you learn how to dance in 15 seconds for people who like don't have a lot of time and I, and then I would just dance to a song and be like okay you're gonna want to start with this and you're gonna want to do this and you roll into this and it should, it should all look like this and then I would just dance like a lunatic and I did none of the moves that I taught you but the song playing was uh, by Frank Moody so they reposted the video on their story and tagged me and then we were DMing a little bit and that was really cool um, they were doing a show with the Troubadour. I would have loved to have gone to the to that show. If you have a chance to catch Frank Moody, catch them. They're fantastic. And they just put a new song out that I love. This is like my current jam that I love listening to. It's called Daydreaming. It's Frank Moody and Young Franco. If you're listening to the pod, it'll play immediately after I'm done talking. If you're watching on YouTube, check for the link down below. Because I'm trying to monetize, baby. I don't want the record company to get money from my thousand views, from my 1.3K views over the course of two months. I'm big time. All right, guys. That's pretty much it. Write it in the pod for He-Man or Dance Hour at gmail.com. Thumbs up, heart, comment. Well, let's get that algo going, okay? Let's fucking, come on. Let's mix it up, baby. Subscribe, all that jazz. All right, the Uno Uno King out. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>